would like to bring up the other three people who you've already been introduced to. First of all, Ruth DeYoung, Richard Keen, and Jennifer Lane. And one of the things that I'd like to do first and specifically because even I as a film programmer don't know uh, exactly all of the details of what certain crew responsibilities are on film. And so if each of you, perhaps starting with Ruth and going down the line, can talk about what it is exactly that a uh, supervising sound editor, what a production designer, and then what an editor does, and kind of, I mean, perhaps some of you in the audience have a sense, but uh, I was also interested to find out how, when your job starts. Does it start in pre-production? Are you on set? Does it start in post-production? So if you can just talk briefly about those things. Um, yes, I, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a production designer. I'm in charge of the entire look and feel and world of, of the film, essentially bringing the script from pages um, to a three-dimensional space that actors can interact with um, and part it, obviously um, play out their scenes in. And uh, I start at the very beginning with Chris. Um, specifically, he likes to work with his production designer. Every director is different uh, in their processes, but Chris specifically, um, he likes to spend about eight to 10 weeks with his designer and, and before anybody starts. And we together sit down with the script and begin to um, bring to life a sort of uh, our ideas and what we want this film uh, to, to look like. And, and we've been in the process of scouting and uh, sketching, building those, those quarter models, um, or still like white models, architectural models, and, and sort of lay out. In this case, it was Los Alamos we built entirely from the ground up, as well as uh, the Trinity. Um, site facing out the bunkers. Um, so from start to finish, I um, I would say I guess my last, I sort of end at the very end of production. I'm there on set every single day as well as um, sort of leapfrogging ahead throughout um, setting up. We, we were across four states, so it was a little bit, I tried to be on set as much as possible, just at least to open and close. But, um, uh, and then it depends, I mean, specifically Oppenheimer, I know we're here at the Island campus, is that correct? Um, we didn't have heavy VFX or, um, so, uh, but, but typically then I'll, I'll carry on into post to work with them to continue if there are any visuals, but we did zero set extensions um, and everything which are myself, Chris, and the uh, VFX, Andrew Jackson, and Scott Fisher, special effects. We tried and we did in this case. And um, I'm sound designer, supervising sound editor, and um, I'm kind of like the curator of the sounds that go into the movie. So, um, the, uh, what's, the sounds that are recorded on set are the dialogue, and it's primarily the dialogue and movement. And um, so my job is to is to create a world around that production bed, production based production sound, but but extend it. So I created a, all the sounds for the town that Ruth built, and try to make it feel big and lively and active and. You know, it was an army base as well as a scientific installation, and um, uh, and people lived there. A lot of people lived there, so it was a town. It was an actual running town, um, and uh, so from the kind of real world stuff like that, like creating the sounds of different locations, uh, what Los Alamos sounded like, what Berkeley sounded like, what um, LA sounded like, Pasadena sounded like. Um, and uh, and also into the world of Oppenheimer's imagination and his um, uh, his imaginings of what quantum particles, how they behave, uh, how the how light is both a, a wave and a particle, and how he became obsessed with these ideas. And 
So from the objective point of view to the subjective point of view, um, I try to create a, a world that's, um, that's exciting and punchy and vivid and, um, and, 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 and um, supports the story and supports the emotion of the story. And, um, and, and try to be as accurate as possible. This was a movie that's full of scientific facts and, and uh, a lot of true stuff. And we tried to, uh, it's a true story, we tried to uh, you know, make it feel as visceral and real and, and, and hew as close as possible to, to the reality of what really happened and what an average life was like. And, um, and then, you know, Chris is very much involved in the sound and uh, I generally start, uh, or I read the script before he goes on production. In pre-production we talk and then he goes off to shoot and I spend a few months doing research. Um, I never made it to the set on this one. Uh, I generally start about the time Ruth is finishing and, um, uh, and then carry on through to up to the finish of the film, which in this case was in uh, February, March. Um, hmm. I um, I put the movie together in a computer. <laughs> so in a row with Chris. Um, no, I watch. I start from. Um, I typically come on and start probably a little bit before the shoot. I'll read the script. I'll talk to the director. Um, Chris's scripts are so tight. There's not. We mostly talk about specific challenges. Um, with other directors, I, I will edit on the script level with them, but Chris, that's not really necessary. Um, uh, so anyway, Chris, I read the script, and then usually I, I go on location. Uh, he has a dailies film trailer, um, which we all watch film dailies together, which is very important to me because I sit usually with all these guys and everybody watches things, and I hear him and wait to talk and I to talk and learn all this information. On this film, I happened to come on late because I was on another film that kept extending, and Chris was nice enough to allow me to skip the shoot, which is not typical. Um, but it actually worked out kind of nicely, um, so it was okay. But yeah, so I typically start from during the shoot when I go to the end with Richard. Um, yeah, and I just I put the movie together. I watch. <laughs> it's such a hard thing to tell. It's not nearly as interesting as I try. Tell them why it worked out so nicely. <laughs> Oh yeah, it worked out really nicely because I actually asked a lot of editors advice because um, it's not typical. And every editor was like, do not do this, it's horrible. Because if you can imagine like a desk job, instead of having like, you know, having stuff to do every day, you just walk into your office and you have like a pound of stuff to do. And someone's like, go through it in a couple weeks. Um, but in this case, it was, a, it was great because I got to start from the beginning and go through and because I wasn't in the dailies trailer, every day I was I opened a scene bin and it was just like magic because obviously we've all seen or a lot of us have seen the movie, but it's just you know everything everyone just showed up. It was just the sets were beautiful, the <coughs> hair and makeup, Louise and Jamie, Ellen's costumes, the actors. It was just this mat, and I kind of heard that there was this kind of magic thing and everyone had talked about, but it was really spectacular. So it was, I got to start from the first scene and go all the way through in chronological order, which on this film was actually really helpful instead of working out of order like I typically do. Um, yeah, so it was just great. It was just, it was really fun, and I typically am kind of a miserable person and don't have fun, which is why I'm an editor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ask anyone, it, like anyone that I've ever worked house. on, I'm like, it's horrible, no one's gonna like it, I want it to be over. But I actually had a great time on this movie, which is funny, because it's a, like a pretty dark movie, and even Chris was like, I'm ready for this to be over, it's so dark. I was like, I'm having a great time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had a great time, it was really fun. <laughs> so I now I have a better sense of what uh, what they all do, and I hope you do as well. Uh, but kind of after the product is finished, and audience members go to see the film, including physicists. So uh, Ben kindly explained to me in a very quick email the difference between theoretical physics and experimental physics, and that he, like Oppenheimer, is a theoretical physicist, and so the elements of the movie that dealt with those particularities were impressive to him and resonated for him. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those and other elements of the movie where you just thought, oh, they got that right. Sure, yeah, thanks. 
Um, so yeah, I should say first, so I'm a theoretical particle physicist. Um, I'm actually in the group that Oppenheimer started. So I'm a professor at Berkeley in the Berkeley Center for Theoretical Physics. And our group was started by Oppenheimer. So that group that you see in the movie, uh, it carries on till today. We're actually in the same space. Um, that's, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> But when you see in the movie Oppenheimer running up those stairs, uh, I run up those stairs up into the building. I was doing that this morning. And um, in fact, Oppenheimer, the actual Oppenheimer, his postdocs, uh, they, are in, uh, they were in the offices that my current postdocs are in. So it's, uh, it was very interesting for me watching this film both because uh, of, the, um, of the science, but also because of the Berkeley connection. And so I really appreciated that you guys came to Berkeley. Um, it was very hard getting into the building those days, but I'm glad that you guys did it, uh, because I feel like in many ways, not just at Berkeley, but also in the IAS and Los Alamos, it really added a level of authenticity to those of us who are familiar with those spaces. Um, so other aspects of the film that I found really resonate with me as a theoretical physicist along those same lines of just kind of being familiar with these spaces. Um, so I'm a theorist, uh, like Oppenheimer. I don't work on the same physics as Oppenheimer, but I work, um, Oppenheimer worked at the cutting edge, and um, that physics is no longer the cutting edge, but, uh, but I now also work on the cutting edge. This is a different edge. And... <laughs> the edges keep moving. The edges keep moving. <laughs> And uh, I feel like as kind of a species of theoretical physicists, we're a little bit uh, uh, misunderstood and maybe just not understood if we even exist. And I think that this movie did a good job of shining light on that, but also explaining, uh, I don't want to have too many spoilers, but I'll just kind of pick at a few scenes that I think are pretty minor to the whole plot line, but are kind of important for the scientific aspect. So towards the beginning of the film, as you'll see, um, Oppenheimer kind of breaks a bunch of beakers, he's in Cambridge, and, uh, and says, you know, I can't, I can't do this experimental work, I, I want to do theory. And, uh, as a student, I actually had a very similar experience. I started working at a lab, and I, uh, I had to solder, uh, I remember I had to solder the circuit together to control the feedback on a laser, and I burnt my fingers and I destroyed the laser. Because I burnt my fingers soldering the, the circuit, and then I plugged it in, and it was just completely wrong, and it, it just destroyed the laser. And I, uh, I, I just could not be interested in doing things that I understood how to do. I knew how to build the circuit, and for me that was enough. I just that that was the end of the problem. I wanted to then move on to the next problem. An experimentalist, that's when they get started. Someone like Lawrence, who we'll see in the movie, that's when they get excited. And that that was not me as as a person. I was always. Uh, wanted to understand kind of one level deeper of how nature works. And I think that the film does a good job of portraying that in Oppenheimer. And then as a, as a physicist, there are many other kind of small hints that are dropped throughout the movie, which I can, I don't know if I should mention now. Uh, yeah, I think a few okay. could be good. Uh, that I thought um, kind of resonated with me as a physicist. So, so Oppenheimer, when I think of Oppenheimer as a physicist, um, I don't think of the bomb. I mean, he, he did that, that's true. Uh, but he was also just a very good theoretical physicist, and he was really foundational in laying, uh, in helping lay uh, a lot of the work for understanding quantum mechanics, for understanding astrophysical systems like neutron stars and black holes. And you guys did a very good job of dropping some of the science. So let me just kind of mention two of these uh, hints that you can then pay attention for during the movie. Uh, so you, there is a scene when Oppenheimer meets, uh, uh, meets Heisenberg uh, towards the beginning of the movie, and Heisenberg says, oh, I like your work on molecules. And for me, that immediately kind of clicked a light bulb, because Oppenheimer at a scientific level, beyond the bomb, is most known for his work on understanding the quantum mechanics of molecules. And this is work that actually underscores uh, much of our modern computational chemistry. So it's very practical work today. This is his most cited paper. Similarly, his second most cited paper relates to black holes. Oppenheimer kind of worked all over the place. He worked on molecules, he also worked on black holes. And we understand now that black holes form in an astrophysical context 
from neutron stars, where, which are the end states of stellar evolution. So the, the film does a very good, of just good job of describing this. As stars cool down towards the end of their lives, they cool and gravity pulls them until they're denser and denser and denser. And eventually you're left with these incredibly compact objects, which are called neutron stars, which just consist of nuclear matter. Neutrons touching protons, touching neutrons, being pulled in by gravity. And what Oppenheimer noticed was that this process cannot go on forever. If you keep on adding neutrons and protons, eventually this will collapse into a black hole. And he laid the groundwork for understanding of black holes. And that work is still relevant today. I use it in my own research. Um, so that was another kind of hint uh, about some of that real science that was, that, that, uh, was mentioned in the movie. And I, uh, okay. And I imagine one of the challenges in sound editing is turning, and it sounds like you, Richard, did a good bit of research into such things, but I imagine that turning that theory and those ideas into sounds is, I mean, it, it's probably part of what interested you in the job, but part of the biggest challenges, and how, how did you uh, go about grasping that and accomplishing that? Um, well, it, a lot of it's just um, a gut feeling. You, 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 you try different things, and uh, you wanted to make the, the quantum spaces feel huge because there's so much latent energy there in, in, in the strong force that holds <coughs> atoms together that we wanted to make it clear that, that the with the big explosion as a result of, of the, these tiny little, you know, the energy that's in these incredibly small particles. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we wanted to um, to almost make it seem like you didn't know whether you're looking at planets colliding or, or quantum particles colliding. Um, and again, it's just it's just keep trying stuff until it until it works and. Uh, um, so we use a lot of, we really only kind of use the same um, uh, philosophy or, or, or method as, uh, as visual effects did in that we, um, we always try to use natural recorded sounds rather than anything created by the synthesizer. And, then, and I think that that, that tangibility uh, reads through even if subconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it, it really is just kind of keep working until you feel like you've achieved the feeling of power that you were looking for. Mm -hmm. And are you are you sending some of these ideas along at, at, as you go and just saying, hey, am I on the right path? Oh yeah, yeah, I would send uh, uh, sounds over to Jen and to Chris and um, and have them check them out and, and comment upon them. And, um, I think a couple of things we, we nailed pretty early, but then there were a couple of things uh, that took a little bit longer to kind of develop and went through a lot more um, trial and error. Um, yeah, there's a vibrating sound in there that took a bit longer to do. Yeah, and, and, and it's, yeah, there was the light, the, like, the light, light wave particle of them. And, um, and, but once we got it, it you, I, even before I showed it to them, I felt like, ah, this is, this is it. Because it, it really conveyed that, that image for one thing, and it, and it conveyed the kind of scary power. That the images, um, you know, uh, show. I'm going to veer off science for a moment and talk about another technical aspect of the film that's pretty interesting to me, and that, of course, is the vacillation between color and black and white. And I wonder how it changed the jobs of production designing, production design, and of editing. Is there is there a different way that the set needs to look in black and white? Is there a different rhythm to the editing because it's conveying a different part of the story than some of the color elements? So I'm just interested in how you both tackle the color versus black and white elements. In, in this case specifically, um, I've done black and white in the past, um, but because we were filming in both black and white and color, and there were some scenes that you see in black and white and then you see in color, so for me, it remained entirely the same. We were not playing tonally with shades and trying to get certain, you know, gradations of grays or blacks or whites. And again, keeping to the core of 
authenticity and real, I would design and dress the set for color. And Hortense and Chris would shoot it for color and they would shoot it for black and white. Now, not every black and white scene did we shoot in color, um, but it, 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 because Chris might have wanted that option, we, we kept that consistent. So in this case, um, uh, it, it, my process was exactly the same had we done it entirely in um, color or black and white. Okay. Um, for me, I would say it was more of just like an organizational nightmare. Mm -hmm. Like to Ruth's point, like they shot some scenes in both, but I wasn't there. And when I saw Chris, we had like an hour conversation when he went to England for four weeks. So I was just <laughs> looking in scenes and I would have to remember and I had a script and I was like, wait, is this color? Is this black and white? Did they need to switch it up? Because I wasn't there. So that was one of the difficulties of not being there. Um, but I had an amazing editorial team and I immediately walked in the room and we came up with all these strategies of how to organize scenes and um, you know, they just shot room 2022, I think, how, how long did it take you guys, a week or two weeks? They, a couple weeks, a couple weeks, a couple weeks but, weeks. but they were in there just shooting a lot, a lot, a lot, and they didn't wait, you know what I mean? It was just kind of a, a lot of footage in room 2022 that I kind of, that takes place all over the movie that I had to parse out. So yeah, it was just, just getting, getting a, an amazing organizational thing. Um, and then emotionally for me, it was just an amazing tool of, character and I feel I mean one of my favorite characters in the movie is Strauss and I feel like him in black and white it just adds this emotional element to his character that was so beautiful and I'm, I'm sure that influenced our editing and um, how I edited different scenes in color and black and white and I, I feel like I just remember when I read the script and I saw what he was doing with the color and black and white I was like oh that's fucking brilliant um, and it's so cool and I just wanted I, and it, for me it was really important that the audience to make sure the audience kind of got it right away because obviously when we see black and white we immediately our brains go oh that's the past and the color is the future um, so I love that Chris played around with that but I feel like um, the way he structured the film you kind of lock into it pretty quickly um, but I just it's I just feel like it, the color and black and white the more you watch the movie you see all the different layers of what he's doing with it it's not like even beyond the subjectives it's, it's just so cool um, I should have said something about the structure of this evening at the top because I realized why well, you might be thinking why is Rod talking so much with these people? Um, we actually will have a chance for audience Q and A after the film ends. We'll have about ten minutes with our wonderful cool guests. So that's when uh, you can think of the questions that you would like to ask them. Until then, you're stuck with me. Um, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to address, as far a little bit back to the theoretical side of Oppenheimer versus the experimental side. Do you think this allows him or um, is best suited for him to lead the operation at Los Alamos because he is in theory versus experimentation? Or is it just another part of his personality that affords him the, the skill set to do that? Well, that's a hard question. I'm a theorist, so I guess I would say yes. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but uh, honestly, I, I don't know the history of how they ended up choosing Oppenheimer. I will say that um, often in these uh, important roles where physicists have to play, um, whether these are purely scientific roles and leading some big experiment or, um, or some kind of um, funding effort or something that does uh, touch the rest of society, uh, theorists are often found in these high rules because we have, um, I guess, a kind of bird's eye view of the whole thing. So starting, uh, you know, Oppenheimer's day was really kind of the last time in physics where you could be good at multiple different things and succeed. So Enrico Fermi, who is featured in the film, um, he was both a theorist and an experimentalist, and people often uh, cite him as the last person like that. Uh, because since then, we've become so specialized, we've become so niche. Uh, and experimentalists, because they have to actually build things, uh, they are kind of, by necessity, they become a little bit more niche. Um, whereas the theorists can keep a bit of a, a a bigger uh, view of the project. So in that sense, it's not surprising to me that they did pick a, a theorist because 
he understood everything. Also, you, you have to remember back in that day, uh, this had never been, been built before, anything like this. So these ideas only existed in theory. Only a handful of theorists around the world knew that this could be a possibility. No experimentalist did. The experimentalists were given these tasks and said, okay, I guess we'll trust you and see what happens. And, and, and it worked, but, um, but it emerged from the, from the minds of theorists. All right, it, uh, it looks like we have time for one more question or comment from each of our panelists. And one thing that I'm always interested in, especially with people who have very particular roles on the film and people who are viewers of the film uh, and experts in what goes on in the film, uh, is I would love to hear about your, quickly, about your, A, either favorite part of the film or favorite part of working on the film. I just wanted to add on a point to what you were saying. I remember early on, it's sort of like, Chris, why are you interested in making this movie? What is the obsession with the Oppenheimer? Um, and he, and there's really no answer to the question, but he essentially was like, because Oppenheimer was crazy enough with his colleagues to say, yes, we're going to go forth. Yes, we're going to push the button. And we might blow up the entire world. And they truly thought that was a possibility, not knowing. And so leading up to that day of the test, and even, you know, when, he, well, you'll see, he tells Kitty, take the sheets in. If she gets the phone call, she knows what that means. It's a success. We all know the ending of the story, but um, I think it is fascinating to think as a theorist with all of these, uh, just that they were like, whatever, let's do it. Let's see what happens. And we might not come out on the other side. In other words, we could have been another dinosaur story. <laughs> what happened to that species? Anyways, I find that fascinating. <laughs> to, you know, just sort of. Um, but you asked us a question about favorite part of the film or working on the film. Um, I would say I think it was the overall challenge. This this film was very unique because I think the name Christopher Nolan, you think massive, epic, tenant, they have millions of dollars, they have endless need. We, it was a very lean budget, um, truly. I, I don't say that sarcastically. It, we were buying, I was buying sheds at Home Depot to put in Los Alamos. Um, for a perspective. I mean, we all had to be insanely creative on how we were going to take this 180 page script and make it feel epic and massive. Um, and I would say, I, I would say the whole, there isn't one specific part. Of course, the world building as a production designer, getting to do Los Alamos entirely from the ground up and the Trinity. Um, but I think it was tackling this trying to bring in Berkeley, trying to bring in, you know, Princeton, I, uh, every part that was in essence to, to, to Oppenheimer, Chris and I wanted to include in that it's expensive taking a film crew across the United States a couple times. And we had to be um, from costumes to, I mean, I don't know your, your, your all situation on that front, but it was, it was um, in, in, incredible. And, and, you know, Chris originally set out to do this in 85 to 90 days, and when we were all crunching our budgets, we he's like, this, you know, it, we don't even know if this movie's going to make any money, it's about a bunch of men talking for three hours, I just, you know, it's got, we've got to keep in, and it, everybody's got to stay in their lane, so he's like, I'm going to go off and do some homework. <coughs> He came back and said, okay, well, I'm going to shoot it in 55 days, 180 page script in 55 days, which meant funds coming to all of the departments to, to do what we needed to do from film to costumes, to wardrobe, to makeup, to props. And, um, so I think it was for me tackling that the whole of the how to was the most, um, that's as close to science as I'm ever going to get. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with Ruth. It, it, was, the, it was the entire uh, entirety of the project, and you really put a lot of attention into every single scene. Um, it wasn't. It's not like we spent 
uh, an inordinate amount of time on the on the Trinity test and less on other parts of the film. We really drilled down on every um, every moment, every um, every scene. For instance, the the scene where Kitty is taking in the sheets um, and the wind's really blowing and the sheets are really flapping. We eventually got turned that into an action scene. We kept we kept like. Accentuating the, the flaps of the, uh, of the, of the there's no sound on that flap, that yeah. flap, that yeah. flap, yeah. that flap. He was watching flap. flaps and counting flaps, <laughs> and 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 um, yeah, and, and uh, the the scene where Oppenheimer climbs the tower. He spent a lot of time on that. He climbs the tower. It's very wet with the sandstorm, and he's you know gets the top, and he regards the uh, you know he regards the bomb. The blowing wires. The blowing wires, though the wires were a big thing. The wires went on and on because we, we 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 wanted to get that twang of a really thick cable, a very long, it's not easy really to thick do. cable. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so that that was we kept just adding and adding and adding and adding. Oh, it's not it's not dramatic enough. It's exciting enough. We're adding more stuff. And um, so it it would the, the entirety of the movie, any even an establishing shot of somebody walking across like the campus at Berkeley. Um, we worked hard on, and and um, and when you when you work that hard on each individual moment of the film, then if some other moment is a little bit um, lacking, then you it is very apparent. So we kept going back and forth, and our process was while we were mixing, was to go all the way through the film, screen on Friday, and uh, take notes, and then resume the next week. So it was a very fast clip, and. Um, uh, which is how he likes to work. And you don't get bogged. We you know, didn't get bogged down. If something wasn't right, if the, if the wires weren't twanging enough, then I would, you know, spend that week uh, fixing that, and dealing with that, and we fixed that the following week. So I, I loved the entire process and the and the research and the like learning all about Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project and you know what little I was able to grasp of quantum physics and relativity. It was it was great. It was really fun. I really like the Pash sequence. I had a lot of fun with that. There's a way longer version of it that's very good. <laughs> no, I just remember when I put that together in the assembly, like I literally went to get my uh, assistant. I was like, come watch it, it's so fun. Um, but I never expected to love that scene so much in a script, but wow. Casey and uh, Matt Damon and Killian just, and the guy, I can't remember the name of the guy that plays. Um, the other soldier, but it's just such a bizarre left turn the movie takes, and it's so, I think it's so funny and scary and weird, and... And he's such a scary character. Oh my god, Casey, yeah, kills it, he's so scary. And do you have a favorite part as, as a viewer and as a physicist? Yeah, so, uh, so as a viewer, I, I was just, I, I thought it was an amazing film. The whole time I was going into it, I thought I'm going to be bored so long, but <laughs> I wasn't. I never. I, I, I suddenly the movie was over, and I didn't know where the time went. Uh, and that's personally very unusual for me. So I think you guys did a very good job. As a scientist and as a viewer, well, I, I think in general you guys did a very good job on the science. I did not. You know, there are some little things here and there which you clearly had to do. But, um, but overall, <laughs> just a few, just a few. Tell us, what? We ran out of fun. <laughs> yeah, but no, the, 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 science, the, the, the science is solid. If not always fully explained, it's solid. Um, but the Trinity test, I thought, as a viewer and as a physicist, was just exhilarating. Um, and one thing I really appreciate that you did with the sound is that um, is that you put in the delay? You know, when you see a bomb, this the you know these the the people watching this test were not that close because they don't want to be killed by the bomb. So I think on an average they're about ten miles, maybe a little bit more away. And uh, sound travels just a little bit faster than an airplane. So you don't just go one second to another ten miles in an airplane. It takes about a minute, maybe a minute and a half. And, and you guys put that delay in there, and as a physicist, when the bomb went off, I was like, okay, here comes the sound, as it does in many movies, and it didn't. I was like, oh, all right, check mark for them. <laughs> and, but then you, you, you made it work, you made it work for you, I thought, in a way that would have been much better had 
sound, you know, had sound traveled faster, it, I think it would not have been as good for the movie. You really made that part work. And all of the science and the scenes around it, I thought you did a good job. Um, and, you know, there are all these, like, kind of quirky little rumors that we hear in the physics world, like Feynman declining to put on the, the UV glasses. Uh, thinking that he was safe behind the windshield. No one actually knows if that's true or not. That's just what Feynman said. Maybe he then, when, every, when everyone walked away, put on his glasses. But you know, that's the story out there in the physics world, and you put it in there. And, um, and I appreciated all of those details like that, all of these kind of physics lore that I've heard about this text. For us, it's very important. Um, for many what about different the sunscreen, is that true? That, I don't know. I mean, it makes sense. So uh, at that distance, you are worried about UV light. So you just made a very bright sun right next to you. And so everything that you, you know, hear people say, don't stare at the sun, put on your sunscreen, that also applies to a nuclear bomb. So maybe i don't know <laughs> it would make sense i i would put on i, I would put on sunscreen <laughs> cool there, there we have the sunscreen answer okay so this about this wraps up the um uh, the beginning of our conversation as i said our three crew members uh, ruth de young richard king and jennifer lane will be here for a brief audience q a after the film uh this is the last point at which you'll see Benjamin Safdie, so please join me in a round of applause for all of them. And please enjoy Christopher Nolan's incredible Oppenheimer in 35mm. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard King, Jennifer Lane, and uh, also we do have the return of our scientist, Benjamin Safdie. He decided that he didn't actually need to go home to Berkeley. He wanted to hang out a little bit longer. Uh, and I also um, wanted to let you all know that because of the length of the film and we want all of our guests to have a good night's sleep, we do only have time for a few audience questions. And I want to make sure people don't uh, say, I actually had two questions, all right? So really just have one. But we do have time for a few. So please let me know if you have a question for anybody on our panel. Yes, right here. So the question is about the past scene, which we talked about at the beginning, and now that people have seen the film and uh, have looked at it with perhaps new eyes, uh, just about what was so exciting about editing such an intense scene. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I, I think I just, um, I love see. it was so exciting for me to see Killian um, perform. He played Oppenheimer. Um, bumbling and fumbling so well. Like, it was so fun after working on, you know, going consecutively to get to a point where we were, he um, is just failing so miserably at something. Like, he can't lie, and he's so bad at it. And watching him squirm in that seat, and then Casey's performance is so spooky and creepy and weird. And then um, Groves, you know, on the train, just being like, you did what? And then, like, just the way that Chris wrote it, it was just so, and, like, everyone just nailed it. And I can't remember the actor's name, but he was great, too, the guy on the other side of the desk. He gave great looks. Yeah. Um, so I had so much material. So, yeah, when I, like, my first pass of that scene was really long, and I swear to God, it worked so well. <laughs> like, I remember Emma was like, that Pash sequence was amazing. I wasn't expecting it, but obviously, like I was saying, it's such a left turn in the movie, pacing-wise, you could never have left it that long. So it was a huge challenge to cut it down, because once we chopped it down, I felt like it kind of lost its thing, and so I was always, like, chasing kind of that first hit I got off that scene. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's late. Um, but, yeah, that's like, kind of why I'm, like, obsessed with it. But, um... It's 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 so cool that he did that in the script and in the movie. You're like, wait, where are we going? This is crazy. I thought we were going to Trinity, um, and I just think it's so ballsy. So I just I just love it. How how much longer was it? 
oh my god, I don't remember. I mean, just a couple minutes long. Oh, okay. But like in the span of this movie, as you all know, it's 10:30 at night. Like you know, right. that's a lot. That's a lot of minutes. Yeah. Uh, towards the back, yes. So uh, in the sequences after Trinity and uh, the, the speeches, what were the decisions that, uh, that informed your choices in editing and sound design? Well, a lot of that really was Jen and Chris. I, I supplied a lot of um, ideas and a lot of um, like concept sounds for the, the shuttering of the backgrounds and um, um, uh, some of the um, dreamlike uh, uh, atomic with particle sounds that that we hear, um, and and I actually gave them a, like a t my take on the whole thing with all of the different elements, and they took the elements that they liked and it worked for them. I think Chris had a very specific idea about going silent at that one spot, and um, we could never find kind of a better way to treat the scene than that. It, 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 um, it, it improved, but it was kind of the basic shape that Jen and Chris cooked up. Yeah, yeah we just kind of did it one day, and it was like, whoa, this is crazy. I mean, <laughs> that's what I think. Like, like, yeah, we had a lot of trial and error with that scene, and coming up with the right scream, and coming up with the right timing, and when to go silent, and... Um, I, I don't know, like that woman, I mean, I'm, it's been a while, but I don't even know if that woman was specifically supposed to be the woman that screamed or she just looked like she was screaming or, um, yeah, it was just trial and error. And then once we got it, we kind of just became fixated on this works. And then poor Richard, like that, that happens sometimes where it's like with temp music, right? It's like we became so married to it. Richard actually did a lot of cool shit to that scene. And, but we kept going back to the simplistic kind of version of it that I guess... I think in a way it just felt probably the most honest to like what Oppenheimer felt. The simplicity yeah, of it was the raw. most devastating, um, because once we when we tried to, to do other fancier stuff that was really cool, it kind of it was cool but it lost the emotional kind of. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the question is about sound representing subjectivity and objectivity, and perhaps you can speak a little bit about how you were trying to represent those two ideas throughout the film. Um, well, the objective part was basically trying to, I think if Chris had his preference, he would only use production sound. Pure production sound was recorded on the set. Given that that's not possible, we try to make the production sound, or the sound design sound like production sound and sound is real and um and in that space as possible like the perfect reverb and the perfect sense of place and and kind of dirty it up a little bit and um and just make it make it feel like so, so you don't question it for a second as you know as what was recorded the day they shot that scene um and the subjective part uh, was really um, a lot of um, uh, experimentation and um, uh, going for sounds that had that effect on, on me initially. And I felt like this is something to propose or something to you know, show Chris and Jen. And, um, uh, and subjective is so subjective. So, you know, it, it reads different for different people. Um, so I, that was a bit of a process, really, to come come to that point where uh, you, you bought it as, as um, not just subjective sound, but also subjective sound that was all derived from recorded, real recorded sounds, and not something sort of musical or tonal or, um, you know, cooked up with a synthesizer, but, but rather um, it just felt, um, even though it was subjective, felt real and visceral and, 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 um, um, and, and in the case of the beginning of the film where he's imagining his 
our minds coming apart, you know, imagining quantum particles in the quantum world and, and uh, um, that it felt as scary to us as it was scary to him. I'm going to take one more question. Yes, down front. Do you, have, uh, do you want to hear that from all of the folks on the panel? Okay, we'll try and be speedy with this. And it's about advice uh, for young filmmakers who want to try and break into the business. Um, I would say, my, my advice would be to, uh, if you're based in San Francisco, to try to locally involve yourself with um, practical film shoots that are happening here. I don't necessarily personally recommend film school, unless you're specifically maybe directing or cinematography, but um, I think, I think other than that, it's, it, it's just, it's just putting yourself out there and in it. And I think physically exposing yourself to film shoots in whatever capacity you can, whether connecting with the San Francisco Film Commission. Um, there's a lot that shoots up here, and it's a great film community. I did a film years ago at the Master. It, there's so many interesting things that come through here, and, and you can, we're always looking for local PAs and people to support and help that know the area, and I think um, that would be my advice. That's how I started. I just dove in, and um, I think physically being a part of those productions, even if you're just um, an onlooker, you, so, you absorb so much like a sponge. Yeah, and deciding what kind of, what area of film you want to be in post or production. And just starting to work, I totally agree with Ruth that film school is not a waste of time, but it's, uh, it's a lot of money and you could better use that money to supporting yourself while you're trying to break into the business. And, learning on the job. That was very concise and very helpful. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening here at Letterman. Wish you all happy holidays. Please join me in thanking our panelists for being here. And see you again soon.